found in translation. The way that our kind speaks is a language all of its own. Knock speak appears at first to be a normal way of speaking, with the inferences, interpretations, and connotations that one would ordinarily expect when hearing phrases such as I love you and I am sorry. You will not grasp that there is a different meaning to much of what we say to you, at least not until it is too late. Once you have mastered Nock speak, however, it becomes readily apparent what is actually being conveyed to you. Understand this form of double speak from us, and you acquire a useful skill. Not only will it bring clarity to what has been said to you in the past and what was really meant, it will assist in understanding how to deal with the narcissist in your life going forward, if you have occasion to interact with him or her again, although, of course, the imposition of a total no-contact regime should mean that that would never occur. Knock speak arises because we operate in a different reality to you. We perceive the facts differently, and therefore there will be an alternative interpretation attached to what we say and what we do. We know the context of what we are saying, so that it apparently fits with the situation, although with certain lower echelon narcissists there is sometimes a disconnect. But usually what we say seems to fit with the situation and the discussion, but that is purely as a consequence of our ability to mimic, to fit in, and to convey what should be said. The narcissism means something else is being said when we say these things. This allows us to assert control through the evasion of culpability at a later juncture. If you try to tell us that we said something, we may operate the first line of the twin lines of the narcissistic defence by stating that we deny that we say it. Or, if we do admit it, our admission is only ever in the context of what we intended it to mean at the time. And this, of course, will utilise the revision of history. We use these words and phrases as a cloak to what is actually going on, and the sooner that you begin to understand what is really occurring and what is really being said, the sooner you will achieve the clarity of understanding which will remove the fog of confusion and enable you to decide how best to respond. By way of example, I now provide you with a number of phrases which you will invariably hear with our kind and beneath what is really being said to you. I didn't look at anyone else the whole time I was out. I kissed several people. I've no idea who they were. You must believe me. This is a lie. What are you thinking? I am not going to tell you anything until I've worked you out first so I can control you. So I need to know what you are thinking in order to then say the appropriate things thereafter to achieve control. Don't you trust me? I find your insecurities both irritating and wonderful. I am annoyed that you think that you can assert control over me by questioning my bona fides, but I am also pleased that you are anxious, because I make you that way, and that allows me to exploit that further for the purposes of control. I promise. I am just going to tell you what you hear, what you want to hear, and of course, because of my lack of accountability, no matter what I say now, I have no obligation to follow through with it because of the narcissist's conditional asterisk. We will always be together. I say that now, but who knows what's down the line, and again, I'm not beholden to you, I can do what I want. This again is the manifestation of the narcissist's conditional asterisk. It's future faking, although when I say this, I fully intend to stay with you. You see, you belong to me, but I can pick you up and put you down as I see fit in accordance with my absence of emotional empathy, desire to control you, sense of entitlement and lack of accountability. I cannot stop thinking about you. Actually, I'm not obsessed with you at all. You occasionally pop into my head and then I may decide to respond in order to assert control over you. But understand, I'll also thinking about her. Oh, and her. And her as well. You're not the only one. And by saying I cannot stop thinking about you, 
You think that I have some obsession with you. In fact, I don't. You don't understand me. Everything I've told you is a lie, so it's little wonder that you do not. And I say this, of course, to offend your truth seeker trait, because you want to understand, and so that you'll try harder to do so. The fact is, unless you access the work of H.G. Tudor, you will not understand me. And that's the way it has to be, because the more confused you are, the easier to control you are. I like you. Here, have a compliment, because you're doing what I want. You're under my control. Keep it that way. I need some time to myself. Actually, I'm going to spend the night with your best friend, but of course I can't tell you that, so I'll make it sound like I'm a fairly complex and deep individual where I need time to myself to work things through. We are just friends. We have slept together, and we will again. And, of course, I cannot admit that to you, so I have to disguise it as friendship. I'm just so confused. I'm not, but this is a pity play. I actually want someone else now. But if you think that I'm confused, this will give you hope. Which, of course, is a false mistress, but it will give you hope that somehow you can remove the confusion in accordance with your empathic trait of the desire to heal and fix. We have nothing in common. This is a devaluing comment. Of course, I made it seem as though we had everything in common, but it was all false. None of it was genuine because I was mirroring you, and that is what I have to do in order to control you. So the fact is, we never had anything in common. I just made it look that way. You will always be special to me, no matter what happens. You aren't special at all. Of course, I think that you are when I'm idealising you, but you're just like all the rest. Of course, again, I say this to future fake you in order to assert control over you. The desire to control you is always there, and the residual benefits of fuel, character traits, are ones which I will keep coming back for. It was nothing serious. You, of course, think that it's entirely serious, but I don't, because I cannot be held to account, and I have a sense of entitlement to do what I want, in order to ensure that I am the one that asserts control. And it was not serious to me, but you will certainly regard it as serious. I didn't do it. Of course I did. I'd like to see you again. I think you're coming under my control, and I perceive that you will be very good for the satisfaction of the prime aims. You have more fuel, character traits and residual benefits to give me, and therefore I need to control you, so I need to see you again. Let's stay friends. This is actually utterly pointless. However, I say this again to give you hope, to create the impression that I'm a decent person. But I also am doing this to establish a basis that seems credible to you to enable me to return and huck you once again. I don't really remember. I know only too well, but my narcissism only allows me to know certain facts at certain times, and therefore, on this occasion, it won't let me remember, so I'm not going to admit it. That enables me, then, to escape accountability. I am broken. I don't actually think that I am, but this is said by my narcissism because it sounds good, and, because of the desperation that is being experienced at the risk of you departing, I'm going to throw this as a pity play, hoping to appeal to your compassion and your desire to fix and heal, so that I keep hold of you. She meant nothing to me. She did not, but yet she did because she satisfied the prime aims, and in her meaning that to me, you meant nothing to me, because I trampled all over our relationship. Of course, I have to say that she meant nothing to me in order to try and keep you under control. At the time, of course, her fuel meant more to me than yours. I must have been drunk. I was drunk, because I don't care, and I'm selfish, and I do what I want. I often am. However, I will evade accountability and blame shift by saying that it was the drunkenness, not me, that caused the problem. I am just speaking my mind. I am entitled, and you'd better, well, listen to me. I am not starting an argument here. Of course I am. 
I need to assert control over you, and you must be controlled. But I'm going to suggest that you're the argumentative one, so it is projection and blame shifting. I wish I knew what to say to make you feel better. Sounds good. Sounds like I care. I don't. I actually haven't got a clue. And I don't even care, because I have no emotional empathy. I will change. You're a fool if you think that. I want to be a better person. You're a bigger fool than I first thought. You always make it all about you. Where, of course, it should all be about me. I've no idea who she is. I've slept with her at least half a dozen times. Of course, I can't admit that to you, because that would threaten my control over you. So, with no emotional empathy for either of you, I slept with her, despite being in a relationship with you, and now I claim that I've no idea who she is. I don't recognise that number. I do. Why is she calling me when I told her not to? I'm not with anybody. Of course, I'm not. I'm not attached to anybody. I attach people to me, but for the purposes of ensnaring you, I'm not going to admit that I'm with anybody, so that doesn't stand in the way of my ensnarement of you. It is all rather complicated. I make it sound deep and mysterious and complex. It's not. It's just all bullshit designed to confuse you. I didn't mean for that to happen. Of course I did. My narcissism did so. You made me do it. I can never accept responsibility, because if I do, that threatens my control. You don't have to, if you don't want to. Goodbye. I don't know who I am sometimes. Ooh, that sounds deep. She will love that. I love you. I expect you to do what I want, all of the time. And this is done to control you. I actually love your fuel, but I have no concept of what love really is, because I have no emotional empathy.